Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, by way of introduction today, I would like to provide a brief description of the immediate lead up to the events of February 24th, 2022 in Ukraine. These activities are on record as perhaps the first signs of the full scale invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation. At the same time, these are facts that have not been very widely publicized. On February 24th, 2022, just before 4 a.m. local time, unusual stirrings were observed at a border crossing from the Crimea in Kherson Oblast. Border guards were roused by something heading toward the Ukrainian border from the direction of the Crimea. A few seconds later, some people who had just crossed into the Crimea came running back, suitcases a flutter. Then the lights went out at the border station and the surveillance cameras cut to infrared recording. A few minutes later, individuals in camouflage gear appeared and they started walking around the crossing. Then the surveillance cameras cut out entirely. A few minutes after that, at the only other active border crossing from the Crimea, the Chunhar crossing, the lights suddenly went out and the camera was shut off as well. We all know what happened next. Barely half an hour later, at around 5 a.m., the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, announced a special military operation. Minutes after that, missile strikes were launched against Ukraine. In clear violation of international law and the established global order, Vladimir Putin had initiated a full-scale war against the sovereign state of Ukraine. We are now at the one-year point of that invasion. And we at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies would like to follow up on our discussion from one year ago about the incursion. Thus, we are conducting this roundtable titled Understanding Ukraine One Year After Russia's Full-Scale Invasion. My name is Tanya povostak stech I am a senior scholarly editor, writer, and translator at the Toronto office of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, or CIUS, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator for this event. We have a narrow fo focus for our roundtable today. Our team of CIUS specialists will look at some of the more significant changes in the international community's perceptions of Ukraine and Russia and the contemporary and historical relations between them. Generally speaking, prior to Feb February 24th, 2022, Ukraine lay on the margins of discussion in the mainstream international media and in overall world opinion. With the onset of the full-scale war, however, and especially in light of the Ukrainian nation's heroic stance against a mighty aggressor, Ukraine and its relations with Russia became front page news and a key element in strategic interests the world over. But the international community, in fact, knew very little about Ukraine prior to and at the moment of the invasion. Much of what was known was based on false Russia fabricated stereotypes, propaganda, and historical myths. Scholars have thus been tasked with evaluating Ukraine's place in the new system of international alliances and conceptualizing for scholarly and mainstream audiences the trajectories of Ukraine's past and present in various stream spheres of knowledge. Today, we will explore some of the key changes in the international community's attitudes toward Ukraine in the areas of scholarship and academia, culture, religion, media, and mass information. We will aim to portray the current state of affairs in these fields, where things stand, and discuss potential future developments and goals, especially in terms of ideal outcomes. We will identify some of what is being done and needs to be done in support of a positive recasting of the global perception of Ukraine and its history, culture and importance in contemporary matters. Um, for those who would have any questions, um, you can uh, please feel free, feel free to leave your questions in the chat. Uh, our first speaker today is Professor Natalia Khanenko Friesen. Professor Khanenko Friesen is the director of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies and a professor in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultural Studies and Hutsulak Chair of, the, of Ukrainian Culture and Ethnography at the University of Alberta. She is a distinguished specialist in cultural anthropology. 
year, Professor Hanenko Friesen will focus on the topic of the decolonization of Slavic and Russian studies. Natalia. Thank you, Tanya, very much. Welcome everybody to our round table commemorating the first year, the, year, the annual anniversary of the renewed invasion of Ukraine by Russia. The brutality of the Russian war in Ukraine and its neo-imperial and neo-colonial nature has shaken up the entire world. And not only the field of Ukrainian studies is now mobilized to explain what is going on with this war and why victorious, sovereign, territorially integral Ukraine is the only solution to lasting global peace. The entire international academia within the field of Slavic studies and beyond is in a state of paradigm shifting soul searching, you know, call it catharsis in a way too. In Slavic studies, we have seen many calls for action to recognize and reform the field and to de-Russify humanities and social sciences, studying the former Russian empire, then you know, the Soviet Union, and then the surrounding former socialist bloc. Social media, news outlets, academic venues are brimming with debates on how to proceed with such de-Russification. Many call for the decolonization of our field. And decolonization, seen as undoing the lingering colonial principles of the political, economic, and cultural dominance of one people over the other is indeed one of the frameworks that scholars turn to. Much has been written on colonialism, post-colonialism, and decolonization with respect to the relations between former empires and their, and their colonies. And scholars of post-colonialism continue debating how modern democratic societies can best shed the legacy of their once colonial status and how they can fully achieve the state of post-coloniality going into the future. So decolonization became seen as practice and call for action. And one, unfortunately, that is very different to pursue. And to illustrate this latter point, let me retreat into a different topic. We convene today here on a Treaty 6 territory and I invite you to reflect on what, it, what is expected of us as members of the Canadian public, for those amongst ourselves who are Canadian public, in the light of the ongoing post-truth and reconciliation efforts towards decolonization of Canadian cultural, public, and political spaces of today. Is it easy for us non-Indigenous people to recognize and fully support the plight of Indigenous peoples for the decolonization of Canadian society? Do we understand what is being asked of us and why it is important to accept the Indigenous perspectives when it comes to our understanding of Canada's past and present? Do we recognize that settler ignorance has been contributing to the disbalances that continue to plague Canadian society and is an example of how colonial mindsets and practices linger in our society? Intellectually, we certainly realize that to change the status quo in Canada and to shed the legacy of colonialism will require years and sustained effort on behalf of all Canadians and especially those of non-Indigenous background. So while we ponder over these questions as Canadians, as members of Ukrainian studies field and as specialists in this area, we find ourselves on the opposite end of the colonial colonizer divide. And yet in a very comparable situation, if you wish, the Russian war generated much discussion about the neo-imperial and neo-colonial nature of the war. And when it comes to decolonizing Slavic studies, and now in times of Russia's war in Ukraine, what should we be demanding from our non-Ukrainian studies colleagues in the field? And while the Russian state is actively attacking Ukrainian territory in the effort to destroy its sovereignty, identity, language, history, people, what should we be asking of the specialists in Russian studies? In what way may one find the framework of decolonization productive when applied to the re-evaluation of Slavic studies? And we can again turn our eye to the developments in the field of indigenous studies and take into consideration, and I invite us to take into consideration a highly influential work by Linda Tuhavi Smith, Decolonizing Methodologies, originally published in 1999. This particular piece of scholarship has been transformative when it came down to reconceptualization and repositioning the, the indigenous studies in the world, as well as indigenous peoples vis-a-vis -vis the rest of, of the other parts of the world in which they reside. In her foundational book, Tahavi Smith points out a few things that may be familiar yet elusive. 
that scholarship and systems of knowing the world as advanced in Western thought and scholarly literature are steeped in Western ways of understanding reality and Western values, and that indigenous ways of knowing the same reality frame it and explain it quite different. Rejecting and discarding the validity of the indigenous knowledge systems, and in fact, constitutes an act of colonial violation and assault on indigenous epistemologists and their very right to self-identification as indigenous peoples. So we are told. For representatives of the dominant culture, it is extremely difficult to recognize the power disbalance, reject one's dominancy, listen to the subaltern and allow them to take over the representation of their own past and culture and future. To decolonize research and scholarly dialogue is to accept the indigenous approaches to describing and discussing the world as valid, actual, and fully legitimate and not to be reduced though, uh, as folklore, you know, local beliefs or superstitions worthy of presentations in some, as some ethnic curiosity in some museums and imperial centers. So to decolonize Slavic studies mean, means also to accept and embrace as legitimate the perspectives on history and culture that are indigenous to the people whose history and culture has been appropriated and territories occupied. There are many approaches to the subject matter and Ukrainian approaches as one of them. And from the Ukrainian perspective, while the Russian military is ravaging Ukraine, decolonization of Slavic studies should, should mean ensuring that the Ukrainian, indigenous to Ukraine perspective on Ukrainian history, people and on their very right to exist as an independent nation is to be recognized as legitimate. In North America, Slavic studies are somewhat on their way towards such a realization, but the journey is rather long. The matter though is that the framework of post-colonialism and that of decolonization is not easily accepted in the field of Slavic studies. And there are of course numerous factors, hopefully we'll touch upon some of them today and my colleagues might do just that. There are many factors why this is the case, but I would like to cite Julie Gorick uh, stating that post-colonial studies emerged at the time of the Cold War, mainly within Marxist circles. And uh, these ideological roots made it difficult for scholars in the field to view the national discrimination exercised by the Soviet Union as deserving condemnation on the same terms and at the same level as colonial politics of the West. The Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies has long been on intellectual front lines when, this come, when it comes to this kind of work. One of our major accomplishments is the publication of the English language translation of Hrushevsky's History of Ukraine Rus. Rus, uh, originally written in 1895-1933, and this book laid the foundation for contemporary story, Ukrainian historiography, historiography. And bringing the 10 volumes of this magnus opus to English language audiences is a key step towards deconstructing dominant views of the history of the Russian empire that has long been informed by Russian colonial intellectual thought. To further promote the Ukrainian indigenous perspective on Ukraine, its people and history, for the last 30 years, CIOS, for example, has been publishing the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine, a very established and, and, and worthy undertaking of the Institute for a long time. And for the last 10 years, Volodymyr Research and Education Consortium has been building the knowledge base and mobilizing the study of the Volodymyr, bringing awareness to the world about one of the worst or uh, genocides in recent history in the history of humanity. And we mobilized even more since February 2022. In the last years, a rapid response to the war, CIOS co-organized an international seminar, Historians in the War, Rethinking the Future, in which internationally recognized scholars spearheaded the paradigm shift in the study of global history set in motion by the Russian war. A publication of the series proceedings is on its way. Contemporary Ukraine Studies program is hosting a conference in May, and I'm sure my colleague Volodymyr Kravchenko will explain what will be addressed by the participants of this event, all focusing on further in, in discussions of how the paradigm shifting is taking place in historical sciences and where it should go next. The war displaced 15 million Ukrainians from their homes and saw other millions getting engaged in the military effort and support work on home grounds. 
and the collection of hundreds of thousands of war testimonies currently on its way, unprecedented scale indeed of that uh, uh, we witness here. And to serve the newly minted ever-growing community of testimony researchers, last summer CIOS organized in Poland the Witness in the War Summer Institute on best practices for doing research in times of war and unfolding trauma. And the next installment of this institute is on its way for the next summer as well. So what could we do going forward? Decolonization requires significant mobilization on our part. To, we need to respond to queries, participate in discussions, and continually educate academic communities and general public about the Ukrainian-Russian relations and the colonial context that has been informing these relations for hundreds of years. Decolonization requires engaging in a dialogue with colleagues outside of Ukrainian studies, and especially with the allies from the field of Russian studies. I am reminded of my recent trip together with my colleague Alexander Pankev to Germany, where we were participating in an invited number of conferences, all reflecting on the relationship between language and wars. The conferences definitely were spearheaded by the colleagues, mostly focusing on Russian studies, but also, of course, on Ukrainian studies. And the exchange was valuable, also allowing us to see that there's definitely an opportunity to embrace further conversations, because reflections and studies, for example, focusing on Russian expansionist you know, imperial ambitions and propaganda can directly contribute to the field of Ukrainian studies, one conference at a time. Participating in comparative war studies, genocide studies, war crime and transitional justice studies is another way we can continue our work. And since the beginning of the renewed invasion, I reached out and have been collaborating, for example, with Bosnian uh, war researchers, one of them the survival of the Srebrenica, Srebrenica genocide and a specialist on testimony research. Ukrainian specialists have been appreciative of the Bosnian perspectives on trauma, war crime research, and transitional justice. Our seminar historians in the war engaged in some similar comparative analysis, although the more studies at CIOS have long been promoting comparative family studies. We have been and we have been and should continue to be wary of the ongoing West planning of Ukrainian history. And this is another point I'd like to bring up. And uh, in its effort to explain the relations with Russia and the world. And as we know, West planning refers to speaking without sufficient, sufficient expertise, but from a position of Western value system, power, and that also translates into resources, and from a position of authority, making projections and assumptions stemming from the Western intellectual and cultural perspective, but not necessarily relevant to the country in question. Of course, a disclaimer, it's not about whether one is born in, in Ukraine or of Ukrainian background or not, but rather it's about the academics who are unwilling to engage respectfully with the indigenous Ukrainian perspective on Ukraine's history, politics, people's language, culture, and society. West planning of the Russian-Ukrainian war proliferates right now. It can take shape of an intellectual takeover or appropriation. It happens all the time at conferences, seminars, and classrooms. My recent case attending the panel of Western sociologists discussing massive displacement from Ukraine and in Ukraine is illustrative here. No Ukrainian sociologist with vast expertise in the subject matter was involved in the panel discussing the Ukrainian displaced persons global crisis. Many Ukrainian sociologists are displaced persons themselves right now, trying to make ends meet in whatever countries they've landed in, in their new settings, while in the past, of course, running large scale, important sociological studies on the Ukrainian society, including also studies on Ukrainian displaced persons, which followed Russia's 2014 invasion of Ukraine and Eastern Donbass. My colleagues are now doubly displaced, now as experts in their own fields. Our forum for Ukrainian studies became a primary destination for many readers around the world to read both Ukrainian and Western scholarship that does not do West planning, but offers valid critical perspectives on the situation on the ground. One way to evaluate the actual progress of the proposed derusification is to track changes that may be happening in the field of Slavic studies in Canada over a period of time. And the Institute proposes right now to engage in such tracking of changes via its Ukrainian Studies Annual Mapping Project, USAM project. We are currently seeking funding to support this research. Over the next five years, 
the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies will gather annual data on course offerings, academic programming in Ukrainian studies and Slavic studies in the institutions of higher, of higher learning in Canada. Such a mapping project will be key to monitoring any changes that may be currently proposed by Slavic studies scholars in the wake of Russians, Russia's renewed war in Ukraine. And such study will show uh, what later will be implemented from what is being pro proposed currently. There are many other initiatives on the way right now at CIOS. All in all, the work that needs to be done is of tremendous proportions. It requires team effort and coordination. Well, let's roll our sleeves. And at this point, let us hear out my colleagues on what they have been doing and what they are come, uh, here to offer when it comes down to the changing world, to the changing views of the world when it comes to Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. West Flaming, that's something to remember. Um, our next speaker is Professor Volodymyr Kalchenko, who is a professor of history in the Department of History, Classics and Religion at the University of Alberta. He is a former director of the CAUS and currently directs the Contemporary Ukraine Studies Program and the Kowalski Program at the CIUS. Professor Kalchenko is a historian of Ukraine and also a specialist in contemporary affairs. Today, he will survey some of the changes that have occurred in the academic environment within the context of Russia's full-scale incursion into Ukraine. Volodymyr. Thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, I'm historian, so let me start with history. Uh, Ukrainian topics are covered by, in, in Western academia by several uh, disciplines, Russian, Slavic, East European, Soviet, and Ukrainian studies. All of them bore the imprint of political, ideological, and national battles of the 20th century. In other words, they have been deeply politicized from the beginning. Perhaps this is the main reason for them to be reactive rather than proactive. And Ukraine, in this case, is a good example. 100 years ago, during the Great War, Arnold Toynbee noted, Many neglected nationalities have won recognition through the war, but the case of the Ukrainians is surely the strangest one. A nation of 30 million, and we had never heard its name. Almost 25 years after this remark, Canadian historian Professor George Simpson asserted that there is no national group among the Slavic peoples so little known to the English-speaking world as the Ukrainians. Needless to say, Western academic mainstream was taken by surprise with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the appearance of Ukraine on the political map uh, in 1991. Um, at the same time, the revolutions in Eastern Europe and the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991 deeply influenced this Western system of producing and dissemination of professional expert knowledge on the post-Soviet and post-communist post countries and peoples. Many leading Western scholars came to better understanding of the complexity of Russian and Soviet imperial phenomena. Some of them even realized that studies of non-Russians previously being relegated to periphery of academic mainstream now should be elevated, maybe at the top of it. And many of the former Soviet studies specialists switched their allegiance to Russian studies and followed their development. However, many of them once again fall under the spell of Russian post-Soviet historical mythology and historical dominant narrative. Russia we lost, the Great Fatherland War, Ukrainian and Baltic Nazi collaborators and some other cliche led many people to believe that the post-Soviet space can be presented in terms of, so to say, good Russian empire against bad local nationalists and separatists. I may be wrong, but East European studies demonstrated even more inertia than the Russian studies in their attitude towards Ukraine. It seems like so far, there are no substantial changes in these areas of expertise. Only a few of the former specialists in Russian and Soviet studies turned directly to Ukrainian topics and Ukrainian sources. For many of them, Ukraine appeared as 
unexpected nation with no adequate history, which should be discovered or rediscovered from scratch. That is why the list of many, so to say, unexpected surprises about Ukraine became even longer after 1991. Nobody was able to predict the Ukrainian Orange Revolution of 2004 or Euromaidan revolution of 2013, uh, 2014, uh, 13 and 14. Nobody expected Volodymyr Zelensky, a former comic actor, to be elected president of Ukraine in 2019. Just a few of many specialists predicted that Ukraine could resist the Russian invasion of 2022 for more than a couple of days or weeks. And Russia still is considered by many a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. The Russian invasion of 2014, the whole scale war reminiscent uh, of the two world wars and the sheer brutality and atrocities of the Russian soldiers, all this came a shock for the most of the, uh, observers. I'm under the impression that Russian studies are in a deep crisis. Obviously something is wrong with the expert knowledge about Ukraine and Russia in Western academia. And I believe this war should become a new turning point in Western uh, uh, system of knowledge. I think that Ukrainian contribution in this process might be very substantial. For example, Ukrainian topics and Ukrainian sources can be indispensable for better understanding of imperial, national, regional, and borderland phenomena, as well as modernization theory. I believe that today Ukrainian scholars should concentrate on decolonization, not of Ukrainian, but Russian studies. There is no need to decolonize Ukrainian studies. Our predecessors, generations of 60s and 70s already did it. And those who are interested in this process, forgive me this self-promotion, but I published a book about uh, Ukrainian studies in North America during the Cold War. Uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's a shame that Russian studies are still underdeveloped in Ukraine, both intellectually and institutionally. How can you fight Russians without knowing them properly? And Ukraine, I believe, may be a world leader in Russian and Soviet studies by using Ukrainian topics and sources. Nobody knows Russia better than Ukraine due to entangled history, nested geography, and shared historical legacy. The ongoing war is making this intimate knowledge even deeper but I'm talking about professional system of knowledge. Um, and uh, I can see uh, Richard Dratzlav is uh, also listening to our presentation. Richard, thank you very much for this book. I published this uh, is last year. It's about Ukrainian Russian borderland, history versus geography. And uh, the next uh, publication is, will be about Kharkiv next month. Um, so for Western Ukrainianists, uh, the cohort of Western Ukrainians, specialists in different disciplines of Ukrainian history, culture, language, literature, they should take advantage of their better understanding of the context of Ukrainian history. So with this in mind, the Kowalski program and the Contemporary Ukraine Studies program initiated the international project Unpredictable Past, revisiting European, Russian, and Ukrainian studies. The idea of the project is to capture institutional, and intellectual transformations in the system of expert knowledge production and dissemination in the respective disciplines of Ukrainian, Soviet, post-Soviet, East, Central European, and Russian studies since the Russian war against Ukraine in 2014 up to the present days. We identified several topics and questions for our participants. For example, how the Russian invasion of Ukraine challenged Western disciplines responsible for the production of the expert knowledge on, on the lands and peoples located, let's say, at, to the east of European Union. What should be done in order to revise the state of the art in the fields of Ukrainian, Russian, Soviet, and East European studies and make a dialogue between them up to date? Are the old definitions of Eastern European regions Eastern Europe, East Central Europe, the Black Sea Basin, Eurasia, are they meaningful today? Do they properly reflect particularities of the history and current situation of the people, of their peoples? How can the Russian Zonderweg, as well as the phenomenon of Russian nationalism, can be possibly uh, can be reinterpreted? 
what is the role of historians in the war? Their moral responsibilities, censorship, forms of a dialogue between different schools of historical writing, and so on and so forth. We are planning to publish a volume of reflections over the state of the arts in these fields with the main focus on history and history related disciplines. Our aim uh, is to present, so to say, a screenshot of where we are now and develop a transcript into a solid volume uh, afterwards. So far, more than 20 scholars from Canada, uh, the United States of America, Poland, Germany, Great Britain, have confirmed their participation in the project. And if there are any people who think it's a good idea, please don't hesitate to support us in any possible way, even financially. Our modest efforts are also part of the global battle against uh, the evil empire. And to paraphrase Boris Yeltsin's famous or infamous question, he asked in 1991, what are we to do with Ukraine? It is time to ask question what we are to do with Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Volodymyr, for your all-encompassing presentation. We look forward to your book on Kharkiv. Uh, now we turn to Dr. Marco Robert Stech. Dr. Stech is the director of the CIUS Press and Scholarly Publications, including the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine. He is a literary scholar and an award-winning writer. One of his specialties is the history and current state of Ukrainian culture. Uh, today, Dr. Stech will examine processes within various spheres of culture resulting from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Marko. Thank you very much, Tanya. I would like to start with a very simple and straightforward statement that uh, on uh, the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 20, 2022 took the world by surprise. It's more than that. It shocked, deeply shocked the world and profoundly confused the world. Um, uh, when I say the world, I mean primarily the West and also Ukraine for, for two different reasons. Now there is a much more complex question. Why is it so shocking and strange? We have had wars all over the place throughout. We have even, even had war in 1990s. We had a genocidal war right in the middle of Europe. What is so different about the Russian in full-scale invasion of Ukraine that actually made the world the world stop and take stock? And uh, there are many complex aspects of this question, and I want to focus only on one. And the one question that I want to focus on is that the invasion, the Russian invasion, and the aftermath of this invasion and the development of the war actually undermined our entire way that we in the West viewed how things work in world politics. Um, first and foremost, we were conditioned to think about superpower politics as primarily uh, rational, geopolitically oriented, based on various economic, political um, uh, interests that involve things that are logical and that, uh, that can be explained in economic terms or in the sphere of influence or, uh, or in a particular territorial gains and especially financial gains from that. But this war seems to be about something else. It seems to be irrational and illogical. And it's and it's uh, became uh, it became of, um, apparent quite early. Most of the Western specialists, military specialists, knew and said that Russia did not have enough military power to actually successfully implement their tremendously ambitious plan of capturing the entire Ukraine within a few few days. Uh, they also uh, understood that the Russian intelligence that was so seemingly since Soviet times such a phenomenal intelligence service so completely misjudged the Ukrainian response to the war. They actually expected Ukrainians to meet the Russian soldiers with flowers. Um, how is it that the second, seemingly second army in the world was so completely inept 
in its uh, in its approaches towards KU and, and KU Oblast. They were uh, totally misequipped, misjudging the situation. Uh, it, how, what went wrong in the rational geopolitical planning of this war? And very soon it became clear that this war was not rationally planned, that the geopolitics was not at the core of what was uh, what was it all about? We could actually already hear it in, in Putin's famous historic speech in which he actually uh, seemed to genuinely believe his historical fantasies. It became quite clear that it is not about territory. It is not about um, geopolitics. It is not about the sphere of influence. It is about something much more emotional and less rational. And the indications came quite early. A few days after the invasion, a number of articles begin to appear in, uh, in the Russian official press and the official media that were explaining what is happening in Ukraine. And I will just mention one of them, which, was, which is by <laughs> ironically named exactly as, as Volodymyr said, what to do with Ukraine. And it was uh, published by the Russian International Agen uh, Information Agency and was uh, written by Timofey Sergeyev, a, a person very close to the Putin circles. And in this particular article, he actually deconstructed some of the main premises of the Russian propaganda machine before the invasion. And he, uh, one thing that I will mention is he deconstructed the famous and, and, and sort of favorite um, the propagandistic term of the Russian Federation, the denazification of Ukraine. He actually explained what the denazification of Ukraine will mean. And, the, and he said it bluntly, it means de-Ukrainianization of Ukraine, which was supposed to include uh, mass repressions, mass executions, of people who were uh, who were the leaders of Ukrainian movement, they, they were soon uh, inf information was leaked about the planned concentration camps for anybody who was not following the Russian view of Ukraine and Ukrainians and Russians being one nation. Um, actually, as uh, uh, the West, the collective Western opinion dismissed all of that. They could not believe it. They, they saw it as some sort of exaggerations, as sen sensationalist information. However, the reality proved very quickly to be even worse than the, than the plans that were described. Um, uh, even CNN yesterday um, reported on the proven uh, facts that the, uh, that the entire network of torture chambers was being planned by the Russian Federation before the war. And actually it was part of the state budget. There is a line in the state budget that was um, specified for that. And with uh, uh, the, the, the things uh, proved quite, uh, quite awful when the uh, Russian forces retreated from the um, environments of KU. And it was, and I would say that it was only the discovery of the genocidal crimes of the Russian soldiers in Bucha, Irpin, Borodyanka, and other places that finally forced the world, the world to be actually really, and um, really shocked and really horrified. This is the first time when the world allowed itself to do that. And parallel to that, there a number of other. Uh, occurrences were, were becoming apparent. The destruction of, of the uh, famous sites and cultural heritage places of the Ukrainian past. Such things as the direct hit on the uh, Skovoroda Museum in the Kharkiv region, which was at the time seen as maybe an accident, collateral damage. It's very soon it proved that it is part of the entire strategy. And it is not uh, surprising that it was some of the leading members of the cultural community uh, 
that at a certain point in the West began to understand that this war is not about geopolitics, it is not about territory, it is not about political power, it is about culture and it's about identity. It's about destroying Ukrainians as a people. Uh, before I get to that, to that, uh, to those people who started to voice these ideas and present these ideas, I will tell you just a little bit about the prehistory of how the cultural community in the West reacted to the war, how they wanted to see it. And initially, uh, unfortunately, the cultural community tried to pretend that what is happening in Ukraine does not affect the culture that this is something that has to do with politics, but the cultural activists have nothing to think about that. Just two days before the invasion, there was a concert in the New York Met uh, with the participation, with the main participation of the conductor, Valery Gurdjieff, the, the odious Putin's um, apologist who was basically promoting imperialist Russian propaganda throughout uh, the world who was at the same time welcomed in almost every concert hall in the, in the world, although he long time ago lost his ability to be a great musician that he used to be in the 1990s. Um, and when confronted by the public about this, the director of, of the Met said, we are not interested in politics. We are not doing politics here. We are actually building bridges among people. What, uh, what happened in the result, there was a very nice uh, um, propaganda uh, context for the Russian Federation to use. Thank God, Italians proved to be, to have a stronger moral fiber because uh, two days after the invasion, uh, Gurdjieff uh, was supposed to uh, conduct an opera in Milan, La Scala. However, the Italians refused to go through with the, con the concert they, unless he publicly denounces Russia's in invasion of Ukraine. He, of course, did not do that. He, was, uh, he is, after all, Put Putin's party. And, and uh, after, and, and the concert was canceled. After that, all the other concert halls had no other choice. Even the most sort of ambivalent politically were forced to cancel all of the Gurdjieff's concert until he um, condemns uh, the, the uh, invasion of, U of Ukraine, and, which he never did. And Actually, it went. It came eventually back to the New York Met, who also canceled the concert and sang a completely different tune at that time. At the same time, uh, other types of uh, reaction were happening. Uh, the uh, the Philharmonic Orchestra in Cardiff in Wales decided to cancel the concert of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony just because, and they said it squarely. It, they do not feel the moral right to play the music of the Russian composer who represents the Russian imperial culture. This was a one-time event. The, nobody really followed up with that kind of idea. And there was a strong backlash to it. And, and if anybody followed the, the classical music circle, Tchaikovsky and, and the Russian composer are back in vogue and with, in full force because most of the um, con uh, concert halls and, and orchestras try to, again, build bridges. Uh, a number of initiatives were organized in which they tried to pair Ukrainian uh, performers with Russian performance, uh, especially the star of Ukrainian classical musical, Oksana Linyu, know very much for her um, a patriotic stand was put in a very difficult position where she was supposed, where she was forced to perform with Russian performers, as if creating bridges for future peace. Uh, eventually, she refused and and took the leave of absence for a, um, uh, for the longer time because whatever she did, it caused a, a, a scandal. A very similar situation was happening in the literary community. Pan 
and uh, and the, uh, the various pen organizations, which 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 are the literary organizations that have a focus on human rights, but at the same time that that uh, um, gather around themselves the the intellectual elites of their countries, started to say the, the very sort of song that this is not Russian war, this is Putin's war, and the Russians and especially the Russian cultural figures are not at all to blame for it. And they should be accepted. And again, let's build bridges. And they tried on a number of occasions to create sessions in which Ukrainian and Russian writers would, would appear together and would discuss matters and especially the, try to recon reconcile the two nations and so on. In most cases, when these things actually happened, they turned into the propaganda pieces for the Russian Federation because most of the Russian writers were, even if the war was recognized as the main problem, the Russian writers were shown as sometimes even more of victims than Ukrainian writers because suddenly now they cannot go to, to, Western, uh, to Western events. They cannot be supported by Western uh, because of the sanctions. They cannot go to various uh, things and so on and so on. Uh, it was, it needed a Bucha, it needed Irpin, it needed this shock of the ab ab absolute genocidal, uh, genocidal uh, crimes of the Russian army to actually for some people to wake up a little bit. But what it really took was to travel to Ukraine. Uh, some writers after, hearing about Bucha after it was already possible. And this was especially, this is especially true about American pen, which was very ambivalent at the beginning of the war. A number of them actually went to Ukraine, spent quite a lot of time, looked at the, went to Bucha, went to Irpin, uh, saw what was happening, gathered information. And I have to say that it is thanks to that, that the, the world opinion in the intellectual circles started to change. And I wanted to give you one example, I think one very, very special example of that. I will try to share my screen. I hope that I will be able to do that. Uh, if you can see it, this is page one of the 60 page um, report created together by PEN America and PEN Ukraine. And this is uh, the, to date, the most complete report um, um, summarizing and detailing the intentional destruction of Ukrainian culture by the Russian army as a matter of policy. Uh, I had a great privilege to be on the team that uh, created the, uh, that uh, put together and vetted the final version of this report. As far the, as far as the title of this report, it is not mine. Actually, a person responsible for this title is here with us. This is our moderator. Uh, Tanya's uh, formulation of the title for this report was chosen by everybody over a number of other a proposal by American and, and Ukrainian writers, which I tended to be either much more vague and, and nebulous or much more sort of uh, raw emotionally political. Uh, this title expressed and expresses what this, uh, what this uh, report is about. Ukrainian culture under attack, erasure of Ukrainian culture in Russia's war against Ukraine. We have a point here of intentionality, Ukrainian culture under attack. We have, a, we have the word Russia. We have clearly said many, many of the writers did not want to use the Russia, but just simply war um, in the title. And then we have the word erasure, and which, is, which actually uh, specifies that this is not destruction collateral damage, that this is a war and by chance as a collateral damage, uh, uh, cultural artifacts are destroyed. No, this is a campaign of trying to erase Ukrainian culture as such. And if you look at the contents of it, it is, uh, it, first of all, it states the, a war of cultural erasure. This is the first 
attempt to, uh, and actually so far that I know of is the only one that states that the basic premise of this war for Russia is to erase Ukrainian culture, erase Ukrainian as a people, uh, annihilate them from the, from the place of the earth and uh, create a new kind of population on that, on that ground, Me meaning in, it was actually in, if you, if you want to quote um, a Russian uh, sort of uh, nationalist figures, the well-known uh, war criminal who, is, uh, uh, who was convicted for the downing of MH17, uh, um, uh, Igor Strelkov uh, Girkin, uh, said, uh, said on, in one of his interviews, he said, they all hate us now. So in order to change that, we have to quash their army, destroy their so-called state, and and uh, brainwash them into loving us. This was, uh, I'm, I'm quoting not maybe exactly, but that was the, the this is the very sort of peculiar uh, vision of love from Allah Hus. Um, so, and further on this, uh, this, uh, uh, this report details the destruction of museums, the destruction, intentional destruction of, um, uh, important uh, historical sites. Um, it, it then goes on the destruct, uh, destruction, repression of artists, writers, and cultural workers, including the museum museum people who are abs absolutely uh, targeted for for um, for repression. It then the seizure and destruction of books, manipulation of culture and identity by uh, through education. And this is this is the first time when they say about brainwashing Ukrainian children and by by forcing them to write letters to the Russian army of, of think and forbidding them to speak Ukrainian and so on and so on. Then targeting attacks on on the museum on, for example, destruction of the museum of Quinji in, in Mariupol, a total of, uh, a sort of looting of a number of museum collections. They they mentioned the Shevchenko Museum of Borodyanka, in which it was. Uh, you probably have seen this picture. It was executed by shooting in the head. The monument. What irrational action that shows the de depth of hatred to the symbol of Ukrainian culture. We those who know Ukrainian history know that this is not new. That the Bolsheviks and and the white uh, Tsarist army during the re revolutionary years of and Ukraine's struggle for independence often were executing uh, Shevchenko's portraits because this was the. Uh, it also places this this report places um, the point on the history of how Ukrainian artists were being treated and presented to the world as Russian artists, Huinji being an example, Ivazovsky being an example. And uh, so in, in any case, what is the importance? What I, I wanted to say, what is the importance of this, of this particular document? First, it is that it is created not by Ukrainian group only, but by a very uh, prominent American uh, group of intellectuals. It has been spread through Pan America to all intellectual circles. It's very difficult to see how, uh, what real effect it had, but I believe that it did have a profound effect on the way of thinking of, of a number of people. Second of all, this is the attempt to already start the registration of criminal acts against Ukrainian culture. In the future, these could be used in courts. In, these could be used in, in, in the procedures. Uh, uh, secondly, wherever it can, it identifies actually the objects that have been looted. It links to the sites, that, to the objects that have been looted so that in the future, when they will need to be gotten back, they are here. Uh, this document 
I am proud to say is still the best of what was produced in this, uh, but at the same time, I'm very sad to say that because this document was produced in, it was completed in the early December. It goes, uh, it goes back only to the end of September. However, it has an entire section in which it links to the uh, sites that try to monitor things as they happen. And for example, I can tell you now with sadness that already almost 1,200 major historical Ukrainian sites have been either destroyed or severely damaged. Um, I, I will stop now sharing this and I will um, go on to say, such lists are extremely difficult to keep. And such work is extremely, and actually this already had a number of, of important influences because, for example, following this and following some of the work, for example, that the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine is doing, some museums start to change the for designations of some of the artists in their collections from Russian to Ukrainian. Recently, it was the, the question of uh, Muse Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, of Art in New York that under the pressure of, of individuals, a number of individuals, um, changed uh, Huinji to, to Ukrainian artists from Russian, changed Vazovsky to Ukrainian artists, and, and so on, so on, so on. And so uh, this is a very slow world, slow process. However, I believe that it is a crucial process. For those who think that culture is not the more the very crucial element in the political life, I want to I want to remind those who know history that the Western Ukrainian National Republic, to a large extent, was denied its own statehood in in Paris in in a Paris conference because of culture, because the Poland presented, the Poles presented Western Ukrainians as Bolshevized nobodies who have no culture, while Ignacy Paderewski, the world famous pianist, who was at the same time the, the, the prime minister of Poland, while entertaining his French colleagues with, with wonderful playing of, of, of their French music, later convinced them to treat uh, to give back Galicia to Poland and so on. I believe, just to, just to complete, because I, I could give many more examples, however, my time is up. I would just want to say that such seemingly non-political issues as identity, culture, values of a certain moral code are seen very clearly to be at the core of this particular war. And I believe that whatever, in whatever way, the overcoming the legacy of, of, of this war will include, will have to include the reinterpretation of cultural and identity matters. We will have to, in a new way, look at the very important questions. What is Ukraine? What is Ukrainian identity? What are the key core elements of Ukraine history and culture? And at the same time, as Volodymyr said, we will also have to ask, what is Russia? What does Russia mean to Ukraine and what Ukraine means to Russia? These will be not easy questions. It will be a great challenge for waiting for us in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, it seems that the root causes of global events sometimes are much simpler than we think. Um, and the Penn report was a massive, massive team effort, just for the record. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Frank Sisson, who is a director of the Peter Yatsik Center for Ukrainian Historical Research at the CIUS. He is also the editor-in-chief of the Hrushevsky Translation Project and the head of the CIUS Toronto office. Professor Sisson is a leading specialist on the history of early modern Ukraine and on other vital areas of Ukrainian history. Uh, today, Professor Sisson will discuss the impact of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine on religion and church matters. Frank. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to discuss what changes have occurred since the full-scale Russian invasion of the 24th of February. But we have to go slightly back. We're at the moment saying the world has turned its attention to Ukraine. 
uh, I would like to statistically study what was going on during the Maidan. I think we begin to forget the degree to which at least those who followed news, major news programs, CNN, uh, saw KU and the Maidan uh, night after night in those months uh, and were amazed by the steadfastness of the population. It may show us how quickly people's attention go to other topics that it seems a bit forgotten now. But anyone who looked at that Maidan uh, from the outside had to notice the importance of the chapel and the religious gatherings that occur. Uh, that is how important clergy were in representation. And indeed, those who followed uh, more exactly knew that while the political leaders of the Maidan uh, seems, seemed, let's say, uh, not uh, the most adept that at points at which uh, the Maidan uh, appeared uh, in danger, religious figures were intervening. The other part of that was that that chapel uh, of the Maidan was attended by clergy of various faiths. Uh, the religious pluralism of Ukraine was shown. Now, what I think we know by uh, sociologists and poll studies are that uh, religion at that point and up until the 24th of February had a very high degree of trust from the Ukrainian population compared to most other institutions, particularly political institutions, but also I would argue other institutions as well. And uh, that might make Ukraine stand out from a number of Western or more secularized societies. The other element of Ukraine that uh, is, are often brought up on this level of pluralism is that there has long been a council of religious leaders in Ukraine who gather cross faiths, including Muslims, Jewish leaders, leaders from the Orthodox and Catholic churches um, who have played a major role as a contact group and representing Ukrainian society. But while we want to emphasize religious pluralism in Ukraine, we should also point out that in some sense, at least as we usually view them, Ukraine is viewed as an orthodox country. Now, what does that really mean? A uh, whole country, its whole population clearly was not orthodox, but at least uh, the national tradition uh, of most of the population of Ukraine, tracing back to the, conver the conversion uh, of the 10th century uh, that begins in Kayu and associated with Eastern Christianity. And so we tend to view countries like Romania or Greece as in some sense orthodox countries, although all are modern states in which there is freedom of religion and diversity of religious groups. I think that diversity is a bit higher in Ukraine than in some societies, certainly if we compare it to neighboring Poland, which is uh, more clearly overwhelmingly Roman Catholic, Ukraine seems to have a bit more diversity. In fact, particularly because its orthodoxy, at least as the official churches, have been divided between a church that is under Moscow, part of the Russian Orthodox Church originally, with some rights of autonomy after 1990, which had the most parishes of, and church buildings of any group in Ukraine, and what were independent Ukrainian churches not under Moscow, uh, arguing for their place in the Orthodox world as Ukrainian Orthodox churches who would be autocephalous, that is self-ruling, as there are 15 recognized Orthodox churches. Uh, those groups in 2018, with parts of the church formerly under Mo that who were formerly under Moscow, were granted autocephaly by the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople in the year 2018. This is not a uh, abstruse fact. Uh, when we look to the workup and movement of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, I think the 2018 autocephaly was another of the markers that Ukraine was leaving the Russian orbit, uh, leaving that of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, and of the Russian state. And the other point I should make out is although Ukraine is predominantly, when you ask the population Orthodox, it has a very strong group of Eastern Christians who are united with Rome. 
that is Eastern Catholics, are, as they are often called, usually in Ukraine called the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. And that is the largest Catholic group, Eastern group in the world. And it is the largest Catholic group within the Ukraine. So those Eastern Christians who have a similar genealogy in their traditions are related and frequently seen as in some sense national churches. Now, why is this religious issue so important? Because the Russian state has instrumentalized Russian orthodoxy and above all the patriarchate of Moscow for its political uses and agenda and ultimately for its genocidal policies. On the other hand, the Moscow patriarchate and particularly patriarch Kirill, as we know formerly and continually associated with the KGB and its successors, but also uh, in a way instrumentalizes the Kremlin uh, and that state to stand for the interests of what he would view as uh, the Russian orthodoxy or above all, as it came to be called the Russian world, an argument that Russia had an or a series of satellites, countries that were formerly independent, but where Russia should be dominant and a certain very deformed and eventually poisonous form of Russian culture propagated under that Russian world. Now, I might add the fact that the, the major in parishes uh, of the Orthodox churches in Ukraine being part of that Moscow Patriarchate up until the 24th of February presented certain problems. There was within that church an element, a group who did support what might be called the Russian world ideology and certainly were loyal for both religious and in some cases political reasons to Moscow. And that has led uh, particularly in recent months to discussion of the degree of the collaboration of members of that church, above all hierarchs and, and, and some of the clergy with the Russian invading uh, forces um, in time that collaboration particularly prominent uh, within the occupied territories, but also it is meant that groups from that church have been willing to go along in the occupied territories uh, and join directly under the Moscow Patriarchate, therefore fulfilling those claims of the annexation of the territories propagated by the Kremlin. Now, how do then we look at what's happened since the 24th of February? What are the most important events? First, we must look at the occupied territories and the persecution of many religious groups. This is not new. It occurred within the occupied uh, territories, particularly uh, in Crimea uh, and uh, in uh, the areas of Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts uh, uh, controlled by the Russians from the beginning of the war in 2014. That is these groups, there were groups who were viewed as uh, disloyal by their very nature. There were attacks on congregations, particularly groups such as the Muslims uh, suffered in Crimea, Greek Catholics, wherever they were in these occupied territories. Protestant groups have particularly been targeted as cl clearly the occupation's authorities side with their Russian world, Russian orthodoxy. I think there, there is a, a, a very interesting amount of material on occupied Kherson and the degree to which the various Protestant churches and groups uh, both gave succor and, and, and salvation to many elements of the population and the degree to which these occupying authorities persecuted them. But I think when we look uh, at a more global perspective of what has gone on, we have seen changes in the position of religion. Indeed, uh, at the moment, it is the Ukrainian army uh, and elements of civic society that come up higher than religious groups and institutions in faith of the population. That is, uh, confidence in religious groups has dropped to around 40%. The others, uh, including the president of Ukraine and above all, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces are much higher at the moment. Now, does that mean there has been a, a disaggregating from religious groups? No. A number of the religious uh, uh, groups and their leaders have been particularly prominent in arguing Ukraine's ca case. And above all, 
providing uh, support for the Ukrainian population at a time this genocidal policy has gone on. Particularly important have been two church leaders uh, who also are prominently featured, uh, and that, that is Patriarch or Archbishop Sviatoslav of the Ukrainian Great Catholic Church, and that church which very firmly, although having about eight or nine percent of the population, has, I think, much greater outreach in, in, than the numbers in its position in Ukrainian society because of its great deal of activity. Uh, and uh, uh, Metropolitan Epiphany, head of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, uh, above all, since its headquarters are the St. Michael's Monastery, which uh, became uh, particularly prominent at the time of the Maidan uh, for supporting students, and which we've recently seen again uh, during President Biden's trip uh, to or stay in Kiev uh, when he was greeted by the Metropolitan in that cathedral, monastery cathedral. Uh, I might add the other great importance, uh, as well as arguing for defense, and in the cases of the Ukrainian hierarchs, making what is for religious leaders in the West often a difficult argument for full support, including weapons for Ukraine, has also been the great amount of charity that has come through religious organizations, through, uh, through those associated with the Ukrainian diaspora, but even more important, those associated with many Western institutions, through the Roman Catholic Church, Protestant groups, Orthodox groups, uh, internationally Jewish groups throughout the world have often used the religious groups in Ukraine to send their support, humanitarian uh, and other support to Ukraine. What really is the, uh, I think, uh, center point now of uh, conflict with religious, in, among religious groups in Ukraine? comes at what might be called the agony of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Usually we call it the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate uh, because it remained a, uh, not even an autonomous, but a uh, church with some autonomous aspects as part of the Moscow Patriarchate uh, as it remains till the present, although it is trying to break these links. Why do I say that? One, because of what I, I, I mentioned earlier, that is that church's connection uh, with the Moscow Patriarchate and close integration with the church in Russia, often with transfers of clergy, including families across that, uh, has had a number of groups who have collaborated, uh, adopted the Russian world, and certainly in the period of the last two decades, often uh, distributed literature that represents that Russian world ideology. And uh, that has made this uh, attack and invasion from Russia particularly difficult uh, because uh, as that church, many were shocked of its church and members during, uh, during that invasion. It is now tried to distance itself through a council held in late May of this year in which it tried to write out all of the parts which linked it to the Russian Orthodox Church. And it is, on the other hand, not officially declared itself autocephalous or independent, and it has not published the documents by which it does this. So still from the point of view of much of the rest of the Orthodox world, it remains a part of the Russian Orthodox Church. And as time has went on, gone on, and Ukrainian government authorities uh, have investigated members of that church, uh, there has been increasing friction over the degree of, of uh, which collaboration has occurred. At the same point throughout Ukraine, there have been transfers of parishes, often uh, by desire of congregations, frequently supported by territorial authorities from that church to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. There are many disputes over who has the right to transfer these parishes, but that's changed the religious balance in Ukraine. And finally, there has been a questioning by clergy and laity within that Ukrainian Orthodox Church of their hierarchy uh, to ask for a clarification of indeed how far have they gone in leaving the Russian Orthodox Church to what degree they remain under the Moscow Patriarchate. Now a few words on, on international affairs. 
I've pointed out the tremendous aid that have come from internationally from churches and organizations. And particularly the Roman Catholic Church has played a tremendous role in that aid, both that Roman Catholic Church in North America, but, but particularly in Europe, uh, various institutions who have sent humanitarian aid. And the Vatican has been active in promoting this. And yet there has been a real tension because of parts of what have been foreseen as a policy by Pope Francis that did not fully want to see the role of Russia uh, and uh, the invader uh, and its guilt uh, towards Ukraine. We well remember during Easter, uh, the Pope, I think, looking for points of reconciliation, wanting to have a Ukrainian woman stand next to a Russian woman under the cross, and how in Ukraine, this was felt that somehow the country of the invader was really being equalized with the victim. Uh, Vatican policy has, I think, developed since that time. All during that time, the Greek Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church in Ukraine have made clear their loyalty to the Ukrainian state uh, and their opposition to the invasion. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, that the development of Vatican policy uh, and of the Pope's statements has been a process, uh, largely because of increasing information, but also because of uh, the outcry of many uh, who feel, who wanted the words of the Vatican uh, to really call out what was uh, this inhuman regime being imposed in Ukraine. Then, uh, the Vatican has also had to deal with its long-term contacts with the Russian Orthodox Church uh, and with such notorious people as Metropolitan Ilarion of that church, a propagator of what many Orthodox theologians call the Russian world heresy. The Vatican had had long-term contacts with that church and only slowly uh, could reorient its Eastern policy. And only now is having contacts at a closer level with the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. We also see divisions in the Orthodox world that are very painful. Already because of the 2018 recognition by the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople of the autocephaly of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, there was a break, a schism by the pro-Moscow churches in Orthodoxy, uh, Moscow breaking off contacts with Constantinople. That is a real schism of, and which means no Eucharistic or communion uh, uh, unity of that church. So a real schism within orthodoxy. We can say generally it has been the, some of the Greek related churches, including the Patriarchate of Alexandria, the Church of Greece, that have recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and been willing to see what the situation is in reality with what has become the, the deformation of the Moscow Patriarchate's attempt to take over the Orthodox world. On the other hand, we've had churches such as the Polish Autocephalous Orthodox Church, which have uh, even greeted Patriarch Kirill on either his name day or birthday. Uh, here you had this in a country such as Poland, where there's overwhelmingly support for Ukraine and against the invasion. There was an outcry within Poland, and uh, the Metropolitan has had to uh, pull back from that greeting and explain it. But it shows how some of these dependent churches still turn to Moscow. And uh, finally, within the world that, that world of orthodoxy, a need to define the degree to which this is not only a religiousism, uh, but a new type of heresy related to the Russian world. And then I will conclude by mentioning the position of the World Council of Churches, which recently met in Karlsruhe. This is uh, an international organization uh, with large numbers traditionally of both Protestant and uh, later Orthodox churches in which the Patriarchate of Moscow plays a major role. Much was expected of this because uh, the Ukraine Orthodox Church of Ukraine was going to ask for membership within this group. Delegations came, including from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, still affiliated to a degree with the Moscow Patriarchate, to present the Ukrainian position. It was assumed that it would be likely that there would be at least an attempt to expel the Russian Orthodox Church as no longer meeting the 
uh, requirements of a church uh, intent on peace. We, after all, are dealing with a church in which the patriarch has promised all those who die in battle of carrying on genocide and war crimes uh, that they will have heaven, uh, heaven guaranteed to them. Uh, far from condemning the, the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, there was a very unequal representation, although the Ukrainian delegates did have some voice at this group. This also relates to the role of the global South. And with that, I will conclude a very important element for Ukraine. It is true, uh, we have seen this within Orthodox religious terms in which the Moscow Patriarchate is now trying to undermine the Patriarch of all Africa, the Patriarch of Alexandria, uh, by finding ways to set up uh, Moscow patriarchal groups. So we not only have the Wagner groups being sent to Africa as elements of Prigozhin's outreach uh, to undermine political entities and seize, uh, seize largely assets, but also the uh, or Russian Orthodox Church involved in this. Uh, but I think the other issue we have to really face is that for much of that colonial world, uh, there still is uh, a feeling that the Soviet Union and Russia as its successor uh, in some way fought the struggle against uh, colonial powers. We have to all deal with South Africa, uh, which seems to be drifting into the Moscow and Chinese orbit. For the World Council of Churches, uh, some progress has been made, but generally I can say it did not fulfill really what should have been its moral values in dealing with the Russian Orthodox Church or the Ukrainian groups. But the Ukrainian churches will continue, I think, to act on uh, that playing field. And this will play, I think, an important role for contexts such as those with that colonial world. And with that, I would end my presentation. Thank you very much, Frank, for that very erudite overview of religious matters relating to Ukraine. Um, our final speaker today is Dr. Alexander Pankeyev who is the Editor-in-Chief of Forum for Ukrainian Studies at the Contemporary Ukraine Studies Program at the CIUS. Dr. Pankeyev is a historian whose main research interests include the history of steppe Ukraine, that is Southern Ukraine, and Russia-Ukraine relations. Uh, today, Dr. Pankeyev will look at the information war stemming from Russia's actions regarding Ukraine and its effect on the international community. Alexander. Thank you for introduction, and uh, it is really good that I'm speaking right now at the end of all presentations, because misinformation, disinformation concern all of the aspects that have been discussed already. So to start, I would like just to stress the role of fake news and propaganda and deception campaigns in enabling Russia's decision to launch its escalated invasion of Ukraine is an is undeniable fact right now. Uh, Russia started preparation for the informational prepare, preparing the information on the ground before the 2014 occupation of Crimea by targeting many countries and specific social groups that it views as essential for its policies. There are three informational fronts uh, Russia has been active on. The first one is far abroad or near abroad and specifically in countries with developed traditions of liberal democracy, but also in places where Russia has enjoyed substantial support. And, and as already was mentioned that, for example, Global South emerged as the uh, ground where Russia is right now trying to uh, to be uh, present also. Uh, the second one is Russia's information uh, and propaganda activities inside Ukraine. And the last one, and the last one is the Russia itself. After Russia launched its escalated invasion of Ukraine last year on February 21st, we have witnessed how Russia tried 
to intensify its efforts to promote its narratives and on all mentioned uh, fronts to create favorable reactions and depictions of some events, facts, and actors that are involved in the decision-making processes, influencing the minds of the general public to so, saw, first of all, doubts and confusion. From the first dates of the escalated invasion, uh, Russia's primary efforts were unsure that Ukraine doesn't receive any help from its Western partners. Different narratives and campaigns were undertaken to deter the West from providing assistance to Ukraine. Uh, first of all, nuclear blackmail has dominated throughout the escalated invasion phase in different forms. In his speech announcing the so-called special military operation, uh, Putin warned of not intervening in his plans and cautioned that those who dare to do it could face the severe consequences. As we remember, the West initially hesitated to assist Ukraine, and it took almost a year right now to break the ice of fear and hesitancy and call in some way Putin's bluff. Russia, obvious unsuccesses on the battlefield shifted Russia's rhetoric dramatically right now, and we can see it. Russia tried to lay the information ground to convince the world and Ukraine about the possibility of using nuclear weapon on Ukraine's soil right now. Also, Russia recognized massive disinformation, organized massive disinformation campaigns, framing that Ukraine was preparing to use the dirty bomb, as we remember. Uh, there were also disinformation campaigns about bioweapons lab in Ukraine. All of those were used as pretext, so just to to to, uh, to create the fear. Russia also organized a substantial information campaign around its annexation of newly occupied territories of Ukraine, as we remember, and they and 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 and, and also try to um, to convey that uh, according to Russia's military doctrine, uh, they are right now uh, under Russia's nuclear protection. So we remember uh, those uh, narratives really well. Uh, Russia also conducted massive disinformation campaigns inside Ukraine, at, and it is something what we need to look at really carefully. Some can be classified as psychological operations that have targeted Ukrainian society and military to undermine the trust in Ukrainian leadership and in the and also uh, in the government's decisions. The goal uh, is to create turmoil within the society and create cleavages that can be exploited to force Ukraine to sit at the negotiation table. One of the biggest and longest psychological operation that was observed uh, was accompanied by the massive attack on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Russia generated millions of messages in di on different uh, in different chat groups on various social media platforms that pretended to be ordinary Ukrainians, outraging and accusing Ukraine of massive electricity blackouts that country has been subjugated to, and and demanded and demanded to do something with this. And one of the um, obvious. <laughs> Uh, mm, outcome is uh, to sit at the, at the negotiation table with Russia. Uh, one of the active ongoing campaigns right now, right now, what we see uh, concerns Bakhmut and that Ukraine's decision to stay in the town despite allegedly heavy losses is solely a political decision. It is how it is framed right now by Russia's narrative, has and 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 it has no military operational or strategical grounds. Uh, Russia's narratives portray Ukrainian this, the leadership uh, as reckless, selfish, and disregarding the soldiers and ordinary people's lives. 
that it is just just uh, because Russia has been experiencing all these uh, significant setbacks on the front lines in the February, and even now even minor successes. Uh, really important for Pierre, for Putin to preserve his position inside of Russia. And the last front is actually within Russia, where we can see the clear case of informational autocracy, where all means of uh, this information dissemination are now under tight control. Uh, Russia blocked many Western social media platforms, closed or ousted uh, remaining um, semi-free media outlets and exercised right now massive censorship, resulting in some cases in jail time for simple likes on the social media post. But we also can see the rise in the support of the war among like, liberal Russians. But we see also significant changes how actually Russia narrates the war in Ukraine. So as we be, as we remember at the beginning, it was about the uh, militarization of Ukraine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But right now, the war is portrayed as the war not with Ukraine, but as with collective West. And also we see the escalation of all kinds of narratives that are preparing the regular citizen of Russia to massive, massive, uh, probably <laughs> intervention in, 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 even in Russia. So what we see also that is, that is really important that 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 Russia also produced some narratives, some narratives that portray the possible lose that Russia can lose in Ukraine, and that uh, can face somehow some somehow existential threats even right now. Because of all of these narratives, the Institute, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, we particularly undertook the project, uh, uh, um, which is uh, looking into all of these narratives that have been uh, constructed as in Russia and then uh, were disseminated in Western countries and particularly in Ukraine. Uh, the project, the title of the project is a Media Monitoring Service. And, and at this moment, we already produced over 50 different reports and every time uh, when we produce the report, we see all of these narratives that are right now in the dissemination in the Western media and how they are influencing the decision making of all kinds of uh, governments and how they are portraying Ukraine. So we can say that some of them are connected to Russia, but some of them are just only as we mentioned before that they are about the colonization of russia's studies and talking about ukraine as a subject of uh, its own that ukraine has been portrayed for a really long time in the flights of russia's studies and and it is one of the major issues that we personally, as the members of our research group, identify that uh, we need to deal and find the way how we can explain and, and pr produce uh, information that can be much more easily accessible uh, for the larger audiences that are not really aware of Ukraine's history about its culture. So for, because uh, one of the narratives that uh, we um, also identify and, 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 and it is portraying Ukraine, for example, as a corrupt country, as uh, the country with a huge corruption and that it is a failed state. And uh, 
the arguments that we can actually put forward that will uh, probably uh, provide information that Ukraine is not uh, uh, the uh, failed state uh, that it is one year at least of escalated invasion and Ukraine is resisting and just only having really uh, mm, developed uh, uh, democratic institution and good military and uh, also for the population with uh, uh, substantial and, and, and really um, Develop sense of uh, na national identity uh, uh, proves all of this proves that that Ukraine is not failed state and also the level of corruption also the level of corruption in Ukraine uh, is at the average of if we look at uh, different countries uh, neighboring countries or other countries but we need to understand that corruption has been used by russia as the means of deterring uh the help uh, western help from ukraine so uh, for example russia created several fake websites on black net uh, that uh, that that they they that people can see that they are uh, from ukraine uh, that uh, pretend that uh, Ukraine is selling weapon right now, that uh, the weapon that was received uh, from West Western countries, and 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 uh, we see many such kind of examples. But Russia is failing in its efforts uh, to portray Ukraine as unreliable partner, uh, because we see that the amount of uh, uh, of weaponry that ukraine is receiving is growing and ukraine is really responsible how it handles and 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 uh, many of those narratives and also for techniques that uh, uh, russia uh, has been using are not really effective anymore and the effectiveness first of all uh, why 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 it is not effective anymore I can say that that world is learning about Ukraine, and 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 Ukraine is uh, right now on all the first pages of her main outlets. And for us, as the institute, as the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, is really important to provide uh, information about different aspects and facets of Ukrainian life uh, to make sure that uh, Ukraine receives accurate um, uh, informational uh, coverage uh, that uh, is uh, not uh, uh, coming from the sources that are not at check, uh, not, not checked. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, it's it shows us the importance of um, sifting through informational um, uh, uh, narratives relating to Ukraine. It's a never ending necessity. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to open the floor to questions. Uh, Marco, can you, are there any questions? There are two questions. There are two questions here. There are both to Alexander Pankev. The first one is Alexander Kev, would you comment upon the growing opposition in the Republican Party and Fox News in the US to President Biden's promise to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to support Ukraine? How much does it reflect Russian disinformation campaigning efforts? And I, I'll read the second one right away because it's also, it's also to you, Alexander. Uh, thank you to all participating participants for this extremely enlightening event. An open question, but built off Dr. Prankiev's presentation. I was wondering if anyone could speak to how they feel mainstream Canadian and U.S. media coverage of the ongoing Russian attack against Ukraine compares and contrasts with the way past conflicts and or atrocities have been covered in these nations. And as, as a follow-up, are there any particular aspects of this coverage that you feel are worth highlighting, either positive or negative? Uh, 
probably I will address those questions. And speaking about the Russia's influence in the United States, and the first thing that comes uh, to mind is 2016 elections in the United States when Trump was elected, and then the investigations into the uh, Russia's meddling into this campaign. And as we remember, the report that was produced later was really convincing uh, and, and outlined that uh, Russia's presence uh, and Russia's influence in United States politics was undeniable and uh, very influential. And, and, and we can uh, see that uh, uh, it is actually true uh, because uh, Trump uh, tried to conceive that uh, his, was, uh, his campaign was actually helped by, by Russia and how he actually did it. He accused Ukraine and Zelensky that actually Ukraine intervened into his elections and uh, and also uh, at that time uh, Biden's son who was in Ukraine on the boards of Barisma etc and we see the uh, flow of different narratives that Russia promoted using first of all all kind of social media platforms and and uh, and, and that report uh, was able to prove uh, that uh, in, uh, on Facebook alone, uh, uh, were created like uh, many thousands of uh, different groups, sometimes with uh, over 1 million reach uh, to uh, ordinary uh, US citizens, uh, promoting anti-Ukrainian, anti-US and anti-Western messages, but uh, sometimes really pro-Russian. So, for, and it is still the case. It is the, still the case. And, and, and when we are speaking about disinformation, when we're speaking about propaganda, uh, uh, it doesn't mean that the person uh, like, uh, like need to be <laughs> pro-Russian, needs to be pro-Russian. Uh, one of the uh, cases uh, is the uh, Tesla's uh, uh, chairman. Uh, um, that 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 uh, produce uh, several uh, tweets uh, that actually uh, were on the influence of Russia's propaganda uh, that Ukraine needs to sit at the table and what kind of in, uh, outcomes this uh, war uh, can have and all of his uh, his suggestions were not uh, really in favor of Ukraine they were all in favor of Russia and and we see that uh, right now for that person is the uh, also for, in charge of twitter and uh, twitter was uh, very instrumental in the united states in 2000, in 2016 and 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 speaking about uh, religion affairs and and website uh, uh, websites uh, so so for even in canada in canada uh, uh while we were doing our project uh, we were able to identify several uh, allegedly connected to russia uh, websites that were promoting uh, different narratives and some of them were about uh, religious life in ukraine and specifically about that ukraine is doing uh, that that Ukraine is 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 targeting uh, different religious group. Uh, first of all, uh, like uh, Jews, uh, and then then also for all kind of uh, Protestants. So so it's not new, and and uh, and and uh, we are aware of the presence of different platforms and narratives, and also those narratives are different different in their nature. So, so usually they are targeting different groups. So, and and they are targeting those who are usually active in 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 and in, in elections. So, and they then that they can can win the elections. And uh, we remember also that several reports uh, were produced uh, by. Uh, our Canadian government on the issue of meddling into our Canadian uh, uh, also affairs. So we, we are 
sort of coming to the close of our uh, roundtable. Um, Marco, do we have any more questions we want to take? I have a question or something. Go ahead. Uh, well, it's it's a multi-part question. Uh, Marco, maybe you will respond because you were talking about uh, the question of of absurdity and hysterical hysterical nature of um, uh, causes of action. Um, is it true that Vladimir Putin consulted a shaman or shamans prior to his full-scale invasion of Ukraine and that his decision to invade was based in small or large part on that shaman's predictions? And what can be said about a culture in which a major war is initiated within the context of such esotericism? Is there a historical precedent or tradition for such incidents? And how can we reconcile such an approach with Western sensibilities if we are to imagine a time when the Russian state or whatever future formulation of it would no longer be a pariah on the international stage? Actually, I'm very grateful for that question. It's a very important and in interesting one. Although this topic seems totally sensationalist and absurd, I think it is a very telling topic. Uh, so first, the question, is it true that, uh, that uh, uh, Putin consulted Dr. Shamans and made his decision based on that? Um, uh, of course, there is no TV coverage of that meeting, and, and, and it seems totally preposterous to us, to our Western, Western sensibilities. But however, we have a number of very prominent uh, political figures in uh, Russia, talking about that, and, and there is quite a, not a lot of them. I think that the most uh, um, is outspoken uh, person who spoke about it is Valery Solovey, who is a political scientist, uh, Russian political scientist, former professor of, uh, uh, if I'm not um, uh, mistaken, uh, Moscow Foreign Affairs University, who e even who was very close to the Kremlin circles, to the to Putin, who was head of some nationalist party, Russian nationalist party, but who started uh, uh, um, who started criticizing Putin some time ago and lost his influence and is now in sort of opposition. So he was pre uh, providing details, vivid details of these meetings that Putin was allegedly go, uh, going to together with Sergei Shoigu, the Minister of Defense, who is half Tuvan. And Tuva people have a very live uh, shamanistic tradition today. In, in general, in Siberia, sh shamanistic tradition is very uh, quite alive well today. And that uh, he insisted that actually uh, Putin made his decision only after he got a positive, a number of positive prophecies from, uh, from the shaman. And uh, what gives this actually, actually credibility was that he broke that story before the uh, roughly a week or, or 10 days before the invasion and said that this is coming, this has happened, this is coming. And, and basically uh, what he said is coming did happen. Uh, so, uh, and there is also, he's not alone. Uh, for example, a very prominent uh, Russian um, uh, lawyer, opposition lawyer and, and public figure, uh, Mark Fagan is, is uh, saying uh, the same thing. And both of them insist that this is not just Putin's idiosyncrasy, that this is actually, a spread uh, a sort of tendency in the Russian political elites and, and Russian military elites. And uh, so if we would believe them, if this is true, what does it say about this culture? Well, to me, uh, it goes exactly to what I was talking in my, uh, in my presentation, that Russia is not, it's a very different kind of political uh, culture from the Western. Uh, cultures, that it is not a pro pragmatic uh, sort of uh, rationalistic political uh, superpower as it is presented, but it is actually, it, it cannot be judged by the sa same standards. It's much more sort of emotional based on some sort of mythical, wishful 
ideas rather than on truth or fact. And, and once again, I will, I will remind you about the Putin speech that he actually tries to believe in these things that he's propagating. So I believe that what when the Western scholars try to understand Putin according to our Western sort of standards, it is fundamentally erroneous approach. But the question of how, what it, what it actually, what they mean by this, why the, why there is, there would be such a, a shamanistic craze, uh, is much more difficult to say. But I can tell you about two things that I've heard about, the openly spoken by the some of the Russian ideologues. And the first is that Russian nationalistic ideologues consider shamanism to be one of these truly Russian deeply archaic spiritual tradition that actually gives ground it's the roots of the russian na nations for them and they actually and these are these are the ones uh, these are the ideologues of of the so-called eurasianism and and they are quite um, outs outspoken actually about this issue of shamanism and what uh, what does it tell to tell me what does this culture represent it means that this culture does not come from kiev and rus it does not even come from Novgorod or westernized Petersburg. It comes from Genghis Khan. It comes, and, and they actually do say, they do uh, draw this connection that it was the Genghis Khan who, uh, who had the shamanistic tradition that, that was basically, which created in, in the Middle Ages, the Muscovite state. And, and this is actually openly spoken by a number of ideologues. And to me, because I'm saying this is much of this is not about rationality, but about emotion. To me, for example, this would explain why a person like Shoigu, who seems who doesn't have military education, who does not seem to have any military capabilities or talent, is the head of the defense, is the defense minister in in Russia. It is symbolic because he's half Tuvan and the Tuvan uh, Tuva people in the Ru in the Russian Empire and, and and later they were considered to be the direct descendants of Chinggis Khan. You think it's it's uh, outrageous? Yes, but this world is outrageous. Uh, this war is outrageous as far as I'm concerned. And there is another element uh, which also is spoken about the by the these Russian ideologues that they actually compare themselves to the Nazis. If you know the history of the Nazi movement, it was very strongly uh, interested in the old Germanic traditions, pagan traditions, and it created the entire uh, sort of ceremonies of these. Uh, the Anand Bere studied this, uh, this in uh, hundreds of peoples in, in many departments. And they, uh, in, in, uh, in Russia, they try to sort of replicate this kind of approach to get some somehow, and they actually justify that this quote unquote spirit of Genghis Khan is the reason for their need to dominate the world, to conquer and to dominate. Uh, and of course they do not see the uh, contradiction that at the same time they try to be descendants of Kievan Rus that was destroyed by, by Genghis Khan's uh, uh, power and, and Genghis Khan at the same time. So. Just, just one more thing about what it tells me, how different Russia is from Ukraine. Ukraine is no Russia and Russia is definitely not Ukraine. If I, I'm actually writing now a series of, of um, uh, essays on Ukrainian prehistory, of culture of Ukrainian prehistory, of course there was a shamanistic uh, uh, culture on the history, on the Ukrainian territories, but it phased out and disappeared rough over 2000 years ago. In Russia, it is alive, and well today as we speak. And obviously it has influence on the political. I cannot imagine Zelensky or Poroshenko or any, any other politician going to actually a shaman in any way. What I want to say that, that the archetype that is sort of alive in Ukraine today is much different. But if you watch the sort of folklore of, of contemporary Ukrainian army, it's the Kozak Charakternik, the Kozak sorcerer, the 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 cause the, the a person who becomes who gathers particular types of powers that make him into a soldier fighter that, that can contribute that can actually achieve you know feats of great strength and bravery and many ukrainian soldiers today actually very openly sort of refer to that tradition in the, in their sort of folklore so uh 
I think that many of these things go very deeply to, to the emotional, psychological levels of perception. And I believe that they do say a lot about, about the culture of the people that they, and, and your question, what will happen in the future of the, this is, this will totally depend on the circumstances. It's very, very impossible to predict. These things are not bad in the, themselves in any way. Uh, but uh, if if the Tuvan people or the Buryat people will develop without the imperial uh, power over them, they may actually turn it into something very positive. I don't know. I know that Frank was uh, raising his hand. Yes, Frank. I yes. raised my hand because there are two questions on the chat about Christian nationalism. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I wanted to just address that mm -hmm. as, as well as I can. Uh, uh, so I think Christian nationalism, as it exists in uh, the U.S. in particular, and in some parts of Europe, does not exist as a large movement in Ukraine. I don't exclude some possibility of some Christian nationalists in, in, in places. And I would have a number of reasons why this does not occur. First, uh, the form of evangelical Christianity in Ukraine. Uh, evangelical groups have in general backed the Ukrainian state. Uh, Kathy Warner, who writes on this field, deals with the Protestant groups, and uh, uh, this is not a major source uh, as it is, at least in the US, less so in parts of U Europe, uh, uh, such as Hungary. The second is the way that orthodoxy has split uh, Christian nationalism, I think, is, uh, I don't know if Alexander has material on this, but I am sure is supported by the Russian disinformation campaigns. It is, after all, one of their outreaches as they pose Russia as the last defender of all of the qualities of a white Christian world. Uh, that means uh, the major Ukrainian churches don't have major representation in this. And even the Ukrainian Orthodox Church that is under the Moscow Patriarchate, I think has relatively less or little of it uh, as an ideological group. What it does have is some quite conservative Christian values, which I think would reach to many of the issues of the Christian nationalists, but are not the full-blown ideology. And the other issue, which it, it turned out to uh, my uh, wandering us to the Patriarchate of Alexandria and to Africa did have some relevance to some of this. Uh, that is the other issue is uh, Christian nationalists and the Jews will not replace us that we heard in Charlottetown in uh, Charlottesville in Virginia uh, and attitudes toward, towards Jews. Obviously much is made, and I think with good cause about the election of uh, Zelensky as president. Uh, I find it a number of times I've had to answer questions to say that I don't remember much being said about it during his campaign uh, as an issue. However, I was fairly sure uh, that once, now that the Ukrainian government has moved against collaborators uh, in the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church that is still uh, ecclesiastically tied to the Moscow Patriarchate, that we might be hearing something on Jewish issues. And indeed we have uh, the Metropolitan Leonid uh, of, sent to Africa by the uh, Moscow Patriarchate has indeed been interviewed and in saying that uh, uh, Ukrainians do not realize or uh, that uh, Zelensky's goal uh, is uh, in revenge for uh, Ukrainians' attacks on Jews to uh, obliterate or eradicate them. Uh, I don't remember the exact words, so that would have to be checked. Uh, but that's the only case I have heard of this directing on, on uh, uh, in this clear, clearly anti-Semitic statement, an attempt to use uh, a Jewish issue against Zelensky, but might be also associated to have that kind of vision of Jews that uh, relates to some of the thoughts of the Christian nationalists. So in that, I think Ukraine is fortunate in its major inst uh, religious institutions, uh, we will see what will happen now uh, if there are splits within this former Moscow, or the Moscow, what I would still say, uh, part of the Russian Orthodox Church that now wishes to be independent, but does have groups who want to remain tied to Moscow. And uh, that there one may see some of these elements of Christian nationalism. Okay, thank you.
There is one more question, and it is to me, so I, I could read it and, and respond to it if you uh, it, do we have time? Um, okay, let's let's do it quickly. Uh, I will be very quick. Uh, I will read it. My question refers to the censorship and antagonism towards Russian cultural capital, if you will. As a researcher of Russian music, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that the programming of Russian music speaks more to the desires of the West rather than the politics of opera houses? The economic factor must be considered as well and, and which uh, was lost in the presentation of the topic. Yes, absolutely. I just very, very cursorily mentioned the issue of the quote unquote censorship in the, in the of the uh, example of the Cardiff uh, Philharmonic that uh, refused to play Tchaikovsky. Ironically, a uh, the Russian composer of Ukrainian ethnic uh, extraction, who was very closely associated with Ukraine and very had very positive relations with Ukraine. Um, but uh, I, I agree with all of that. All of this. This is by uh, Russian um, classical music has been very strongly supported over over the years among uh, others by the Russian government. And it did develop a very strong following in the West. Much of the Western public is interested in hearing Russian music and pays for it to come it. And definitely this is part of why it is uh, it, it continues. And I am not one of these people who say that there should be a censorship of this. I think that it is much more important to learn more about the figures in, in Russian music, who sometimes are not Russian at all, but maybe Ukrainian or some other people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all of our speakers today for their valuable insights and a collective thank you to all of you who joined us for this important event. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody.